The Guardian. The first reports emerged on New Year's Eve, a mysterious respiratory virus that had infected dozens of workers and visitors to a seafood market in Wuhan, central China. The virus had similarities to SARS, which killed more than 700 people when it struck the region in 2002. In the three weeks since then, the crisis has escalated, with the number of cases tripling in the past week and dozens currently in hospital in a critical state. Referred to as the Wuhan virus, it infects the lungs and can lead to difficulty breathing, fever, coughing and pneumonia. The city of Wuhan is now on lockdown, with its 11 million residents barred from leaving. Outbound transport has been suspended ahead of the Chinese Lunar New Year holiday, which normally sees millions travelling across the country to visit family and friends. Experts say that we now stand at a tipping point where we could either see the outbreak brought under control or see it accelerate into a global pandemic. So the, the key information for understanding the transmissibility of the virus is, is starting to come out now and over the next few weeks will be the critical information. And what we're trying to understand is something called the reproduction number, which is the average number of secondary cases that each infected person generates. That's Rosalind Ego, who models how diseases spread and how to mitigate epidemics. We'll be speaking to her later in the episode. As Rosalind points out, for researchers looking to understand and model the virus, it's still early days. But for this week's episode, we wanted to find out what is and isn't known about this new coronavirus outbreak. To get to grips with exactly what a coronavirus is, Earlier this week, I spoke to Ian Jones, Professor of Virology at the University of Reading. The coronavirus is one of a group of what's called RNA viruses, and the coronaviruses are normally identified by their particular appearance under the electron microscope. They have a fringe around the outside that looks a little bit like the corona around the sun, which is how they were first named. They're quite widespread in biology and basically if it walks, swims or flies, it will probably have a known coronavirus associated with it. So the average person will have had one of these probably in their life? Yes, they've probably had about three or four actually, especially when they were young. They usually cause only mild respiratory disease and unless you have a particular propensity to get sick from respiratory infections, then you're likely to have shrugged it off pretty much like a common cold. And we think that the new virus that's been identified in Wuhan, that that was a respiratory transmitted virus. Yes, I think that's the current understanding. So the sequence of the virus was released just a week ago, and the closest relative in the sequence database is a bat virus, but the closest relative that has been seen previously in man was the SARS virus, which emerged in 2002, which alerted the world to the possibility that these uh, viruses can be a so-called zoonotic infection, that is, they can pass from animals to people, and when they do that, they tend to cause moderate to severe disease, and therefore we need to be aware that that is a possibility, that there's a threat level that we need to assess when these things occur, and to prepare for them whenever possible. In this case, we know that the outbreak seemed to start at a fish market, but it was one where there were also various wild animals being sold. Knowing that, how, how do you go about tracking down the source? Now that the sequence of the virus is known, we can go back and look at what's present in the animals that would have been sold in the wet food market. You're right that the only description early on was that it was a seafood market, and that certainly threw me for a while. But once there was a recognition that it sold live meat as well, then it provided an obvious route for virus to get from a natural source, whatever that is, to probably the handlers in the first place, the people who were selling the produce, and of course the people who then bought it and visited the market generally. Because presumably fish don't suffer from these kind of 
colds and flus? Well, they have this type of virus, but not this particular one. And the jump, as it were, from fish to humans would be considered to be far too great for it to be a realistic possibility that it came directly from seafood. So it's much more likely to have come from an animal which was being sold on the same premises. So there's a certain amount of threat here which relates to butchering wild animals without knowing whether or not they're infected with something, whether or not blood is splashed around and other body fluids. But in the end, the virus has to have enough capacity to infect human cells if it finds itself in that situation. For a virus to do that, does it have to make any kind of further adaptations or changes or can it jump from an animal to a person and immediately be ready to spread between people? The general rule is that the first jump is an accidental jump and the subsequent jumps are also accidental. As you say, they're just dependent on very close contact, family members, healthcare workers, that sort of thing. And that every time that jump happens, it is increasingly difficult. And so The natural situation is that the animal virus, whilst it has the capacity to just about get going into the first individuals that it gets into, it doesn't spread efficiently through the population. In order to spread efficiently, the general requirement is the virus has to pick up some mutations. Those mutations will adapt the virus to growing in human cells as opposed to animal cells and generally speaking that would lead to more virus available in the respiratory tract and therefore more opportunity for it to be coughed out and more opportunity for it to be acquired by someone who's nearby. So presumably that's part of why it's so important to contain it in the early phase of an outbreak to minimise that chance of it adapting and becoming stronger. Exactly. Well, stronger, I think, is a, is a dangerous word. It's certainly what the epidemiology, the molecular epidemiology will be now looking out for is any indication that the virus is adapting to the human species, whether it's picking up mutations that then become fixed in the genome because they give the virus an advantage in that species. Recent reports from Chinese authorities have suggested that the virus may be mutating. As Ian explained, this isn't unexpected. Flu, for example, mutates, which is why we need different vaccines each year. Yet with a threefold increase in the number of cases in just the past week, and more than 17 deaths, I wanted to know from Ian just how worried we should be about the outbreak. I think it's important not to overreact. I mean, people who... Uh, towards the end of their lives or have serious underlying respiratory problems um, are, I'm afraid, likely to die of a respiratory infection. That's just the way it is. And that could be flu. It could be a handful of any other virus that strikes, particularly in the winter. So this is another of those. The thing we don't know is, because it's a new virus, just how it will behave going forward. It's clearly not in the human population already, so there's no immunity So there is the possibility that it could spread widely. But on the other hand, being an animal virus, we would expect it mostly to be attuned to growing in animal cells and not in human cells. And that would suggest that the transmission may be quite limited. But we have to wait and see. If you are someone who's you know, started having these symptoms, you go into hospital, how do you get treated? Is it a case of managing the symptoms or is there something that you can just give, like obviously not antibiotics if it's a virus, but you know, the equivalent of that that wipes it out? It's the former. So at the moment you're looking to stabilise the patient through the dangerous phase when they're finding breathing difficult before the immune system will get on top of the virus and hopefully eradicate it. There are experimental drugs, particularly after the SARS outbreak, a number of these were developed. They generally inhibit the replication of the virus. You prevent the virus making more copies of itself and it therefore cannot pass on to any new individual. But none of them, as far as I know, have been licensed for clinical use. And once you've got the information, the sequence of the virus, and um, you've looked at it under a microscope, 
are there other things you can do? Can you create a vaccine for it, for example? Uh, yes, you can do that. And the basis of vaccination against coronavirus is well understood. If you generate antibodies against the external components of the virus particle, they are generally protective. And there are lots of experimental studies which indicate that that is a successful approach to preventing infection. But the more immediate thing you can do when you know the sequence is to confirm that anyone presenting with pneumonia-like symptoms really does have this virus. And if they do, then to isolate them so that